Hi, this is Loki, and today I'm going to be doing my reading wrap-up for June and July. Most of these books I actually read in July and I enjoyed them, um, but I don't know that I have kind of a sense of the categorizations that I usually do where, you know, there are books that I know that I really didn't like and books that I liked and books that I loved. Um, there is one book that I really, really loved. The rest, I was kind of like, I like them. I just don't know if they all necessarily really stuck with me. So I'm I'm not going to do my usual sort of categories. I'm just going to of like, like, didn't like, all of that. I'm just going to list them sort of in an order that I think reflects how I enjoyed them. Um, but. I did enjoy all of them, so even the book that I start with first, it's not that I hated it, it just didn't didn't strike me as much as the ones towards the end of the list. So speaking of that first book, this is Grim Space by Anna Geary, and this is the first in her Sarantha Jacks uh, series. And the series is basically a, so a space opera, it's a sci-fi series where Sarantha Jacks, she's this woman who has this ability to basically help guide ships through what's called grim space where basically she can take ships from one place to another um, but she has to work with a pilot to be able to do this so it's like a very close almost pacific rim-y kind of relationship and the ship that she was on unfortunately crashed and she was the only survivor and she's basically been sort of kept in a prison-like situation until a bunch of fighters rescue her for their own purposes. And over the course of the book, she develops very complex relationships with all of these people, especially the pilot March, who she has to work with be able to, to be able to take their ship through different parts of space. So as you might expect from a space opera, this book has a lot of imagination, a lot of cool creatures and interesting societies. And I think Aguirre also does a really good job bringing out the different incentives and moralities that are kind of part of of these characters and uh, that really gives rise to the complica complicated relationships between them. So it was really fun to read kind of the relationships that build over the course of this book. I will say that there is a romance that for me was a little bit kind of annoying because it, even though you see it coming, you know it, you might even know it from the way I describe the plot. I just found the actual execution a little bit abrupt. There are more books in the series and it's one of those things where maybe if the books kind of came across my way and I had nothing else to read, I would read them. But it's just not necessarily a series that I'm so invested in that I feel the need to go seek the, out the rest of the books. So the next book I'm going to be talking about is The Bone Witch by Rin Shapeko, and this is the first in a YA fantasy series, and it follows the story of T, who is a witch who can basically do necromancy. And in this world, witches are called Asha, they're sort of raised in this sort of geisha-like system. So T is narrating the story of her training to another character, and the stories of her training are put up against images of her sort of like in the present, doing some kind of gnarly stuff so that you're basically left wondering how this character and her training give rise to the 17 year old witch who seems to be borderline villainous in the present day. This is a very hard read for me to get through. I found it very slow at times. The only thing that really kept me motivated to keep keep kind of pushing through was the fact that I really love Rin Shipeko's first series, The Girl from the Well, which is a two book YA series based on Japanese horror. I think Rin Shipeko is really at her best when she's bringing kind of villainous mythological girls to life. But otherwise, I found this book kind of boring. I think this book has the feeling of like Memoirs of a Geisha or Queen of the Night or Kushiel's Dart, these books that I find really engaging because they're about these women who are powerful but also brought up through these courtesan-like systems that are fascinating both for the power that they wield but also for the kind of the immense amount of training and what that training says about how we see feminine, uh, femininity. And a lot of those elements are part of uh, uh, T's training that's definitely a part of her story to have this sort of feminine arts like instilled in her but also kind of have her question them and how they reinforce the general roles of her society but ultimately there's just not much else happening in this book and the way that these this training is described is not interesting. I really feel like this book maybe could have benefited from being maybe sort of like the Queen of the Night where it's just one long epic tale where, so that the story is actually developed. We kind of have like a prelude to a story but the prelude is stretched out over the whole book and by the end of the book I'm still not entirely sure what the story is. But the ending did grab me enough that and in T in particular the way that she's portrayed did keep me interested in what the rest of her story is going to be. So when the next book is released, I will probably check it out. So the next book is The Fever by Megan Abbott, and this is a thriller that takes place in a small town where 
one day in class, a high school girl has a mysterious seizure that no one can explain, and then it seems to start spreading to other girls in the class. This basically throws the life of her friends and their families into a lot of paranoia as they try to figure out like what's happening and whether they can whether it's something that they might be affected by. In particular, this book is centered around one of the friends, Dini, and Dini's brother Eli, as well as their father, who's a teacher in the school. As parents and other students try to figure out what's happening, everything from like the local lake to HPV vaccines come under suspicion, while Dini and her friends and family come to terms with a lot of the secrets that they're hiding from each other. Other. This book kind of feels like The Crucible meets Black Holes by Charles Byrne, which is a really good but unsettling graphic novel about teens who are being subjected to a mysterious plague that seems connected to their sexuality. This book in particular is written around that sense of paranoia and uncertainty connected with teenagers and especially teenage girls who are figuring out what sexuality and sex means to them and what it means for how they're viewed by others around them. This book was a really consuming read and I sped through it. I did have a few frustrations though. From the beginning the book alternates point of views from like Dini, her brother, and her father, and it does it relatively quickly. And I think the speed at which it alternates between those point of views, um, first of all, was very abrupt, and it also prevented the book from being able to build tension, I thought, later on. I also felt like there were some threads left ambiguous at the end that didn't have to be, or maybe shouldn't have been, because it just sort of felt unfinished. Like there's threads that are left ambiguous that I thought like it made sense for them to be a left ambiguous, like I don't need to have all the answers. But then there were some that that you know just kind of faded out, but they still seemed like they had meaning, but they just weren't explored in a way that I found satisfying. I'd recommend this book for people who love sort of a good unsettled town kind of story. I thought there were a lot of elements of that paranoia that comes from when you all know a place and live in a place. I, I just thought that was well done. The next is a book that I talked about in my recent Mixed Reads video, um, which I'll link to below. So I'm not going to get super into it, um, but this is Day of the Duchess by Sarah McLean. This is the latest in her Scandals and Scoundrels series. It's about the Duke of Haven named Malcolm and his estranged wife, Serafina. And basically they haven't seen each other for a long time but Serafina has come back into town and she wants a divorce and he basically is like well I want to win you back and she says well I will stay for you with you for a summer but I'm gonna help you find a new wife and those are the terms that sort of dictate them and like sort of pursuing a reconciliation and the book is mostly fun I did have some qualms with it which I like I said I discussed more in my re recent mixed reads video in sort of a spoilery way I will say that overall I love Sarah McLean's books I've said before she's one of my favorite romance writers for me this ranks a little bit lower on my list of her books I just wasn't as invested in it as I am in a lot of the other books that I've read by her and I think the whole I'm gonna find you a new wife subplot just kind of felt like meh because you kind of knew like it's not gonna happen so I think it was tons of fun, it's just not as fun, it's, it's just I didn't love it as much as her other books. So next is another thriller, this is Penance by Kinai Minato and translated by Philip Gabriel. And Penance is about four girls who are living um, in the country in Japan, they're all in the same elementary school and are friends with each other, along with a girl, Emily, who's moved in from the city to their town. And one day they're all playing together and a stranger separates Emily from the group and kills her. The four girls are unable to identify the stranger and so her killer basically goes you know unfound and in the years after her murder the need for penance they all feel basically takes on different forms each chapter in the book follows one of the girls and as you read each one you get closer and closer to finding out who killed Emily but what becomes even more vivid is how the way the girls are raised and their families that surround them really impact their responses to like this intense trauma. I do think the ending was a little bit rushed and usually I would find that a little bit more frustrating but for me what I was really invested in was the curls themselves and how they grow up and change over time and how that is response to to their kind of personal um, dynamics and the surroundings around them. Even if I felt like the ending could maybe used a little bit more examination I was ultimately really satisfied with the, the the arcs of the characters themselves and found the book really great overall. The book does contain a fairly graphic image of Emily's body after she is killed and it does also contain other disturbing images of sexual abuse and incest so please keep that in mind. So next up is another book from my recent mixed reads video and this is The Gusties by Megan Whalen Turner which is a YA fantasy book um, that is the most recent release from her Queen's Thief series. If you've been reading the 
Queen's Thief series, you have been waiting forever for this book to come out. And so I was really excited about it, but I did have some mixed feelings, which I discussed more in that um, that uh, video. Thickest Thieves takes place mostly in an empire that we've like kind of read about and heard about in other books of the series, but haven't really engaged in. Um, so we see a character who's basically trying to escape that empire and go back to the other one that we as audience members are like more familiar with and maybe more like a little bit more in line with. And he's on the run with a stranger from this country and over the course of the book their their relationship goes from one that's very distrusting to maybe one of more meaning. And while I have qualms with what some of what I think the book doesn't really follow through on, overall Turner may, remains really talented at uh, bringing together really complex narratives and complex characters and relationships so where you just want to see everything through to the end. So honestly I just hope we don't have to wait as long for her next book. And last, this is a book that I just love with like no qualms, I have no caveats. This is Hate to Want You by Alicia Ray. This is a romance novel and Alicia Ray writes really great romances. She writes like really great combination of angst and smut. I've always enjoyed her book. Like I knew this book was coming out. It just for some reason wasn't like one of the books that I was like I am so excited for this for 2017. Like I knew I was gonna read it. It just wasn't on my list and I just didn't like have that feeling of like as soon as it comes out I'm gonna read it. But that ended up being a huge mistake. So this book is about Livy Kane and Nicholas Chandler. Um, these are the children of two families that are basically were once great friends, really like they were business partners going back like two generations. But they're now bitter rivals because Nicholas's father is a dick and cheated Livy's mother out of her share in the business. And that action basically drove a whole wedge in Nicholas and Livy's uh, relationship that they had when they were younger. So in the time since they've broken up. They basically have not lived in the same town. Libby has been traveling around the country as a tattoo artist, but they do meet up on one night a year to basically hook up. And they've agreed that this means nothing, no one will know about it. Of course all of this comes to a head when 10 years later Libby has to come back to, and return to the town to take care of her mother. I feel like it's really hard to strike the right balance of angst and romance because a lot of times when you're keeping two characters apart, you know, basically for the sake of the plot, for the sake of the pacing, it's really hard to do without making them come off as like stupid or like emotionally incompetent and I think this book did a really good job striking that balance um, because you know that a big part of the reason why they can't just like sit down and have a conversation about their feelings is because they have all of this family kind of baggage. I was really happy with this book. I really loved it. I think this is one of my favorite romances that I've read and I am super excited for the next book in the series um, which is going to follow two more characters who like you kind of see that it's going to happen and like based on the summary it's like yes this is gonna be so angsty. I will say that if you are someone who's like looking to get into romance novels or if so you're someone who reads romances and you don't you know you don't like that much smut this might not be the right um the right book to start off with or to read. Alicia Ray's books definitely they they are on the, the smuttier side um so just keep that in mind if you're thinking about reading this. And the last is not a book this is a podcast but I think this is like <laughs> essential for book two people. So if you follow podcasts you maybe already have an idea of where I'm going with this. This is LeVar Burton's latest podcast which is called LeVar Burton Reads and in this podcast basically every episode LeVar Burton uh, just reads a short story. So I grew up on reading Rainbow which was his show that basically was around when I was a kid where he talks about books and gets kids excited about books. I feel like it's maybe like a an early booktube kind of inspiration and by his own admission this podcast is basically for all the grown-ups who watched his show as a kid. His voice is just so amazing. He just has this perfect soothing kind of voice that is so good for reading stories and I kind of forgot how amazing he is for that. I also really like how the shows are edited. There is kind of some stylized action going on with his voice and music but it's never kind of overwhelming. It's never distracting. The stories he selects are also super interesting. The first one is called Kin by Bruce McAllister and it's about like a kid and this alien assassin and somehow able to strike this really cool balance of absurd but sweet. If you want to kind of up your short story like listening or reading this is perfect. Also if you do like this podcast 
I highly recommend listening to the episode of The Read um, where Kid Fury and Crystal interview LeVar Burton. It's just basically everyone is so giddy. Like they're giddy to be interviewing him. He's giddy to be there with them. And everyone is just so happy. I just, I feel like it's this perfect culmination of like geek culture and also very specifically for them. It's like black geek culture that I might not belong to, but you just always are happy to see people so happy to see themselves represented and to be like meeting their heroes. LeVar Burton also talks a bit about how he picks short stories and how they put the show together so I also just found it very fascinating. So I highly recommend listening to that. I will link to both of those shows below. Um, so yeah, thank you for watching. Um, I hope you guys had a good reading month and yeah, bye!